Amen. Well, last week I started a series on <clears throat> um, knowing who our God is. Who is it that we really serve? Do we really understand? Do we truly believe um, exactly what it means to serve uh, Jehovah God? What do we believe about that? And so this morning, um, I want to continue along that line. Who is this King of Glory? By talking about Jesus as the Word of God. I want to start with a, a scripture in John chapter 1. The first 17 verses. It says this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. And so John is talking about uh, the word of God coming in the form of Jesus, being made flesh to dwell among us. But last night as I was reflecting on this, because of we're talking about the word of God, and as I was praying, uh, God dropped into my heart that, you know, when we talk about the word of God, often the enemy wants to come and steal, the enemy will distort the word of God. That's what he does, right? In the Garden of Eden, he distorted the word of God. He told Eve, you know, did God really say, and made that question mark in her head. And then we see that um, same serpent in the book of Job, where um, he talks about Le Leviathan. He becomes the, the sea creature of Leviathan. But then we skip way over to the book of Revelation, and we see that that serpent is now being described as the dragon. That serpent has now grown. The dragon's a lot bigger imagery than a serpent, right? And so what the enemy started off as being a, a, a little voice of deception to one person grows to bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger deceptions about the Word of God. And we're living in the end times when there's a lot of deception. There's a lot of twisting in our culture about what the Word of God truly says. And so it was put on my heart that because we are talking about Jesus as the Word of God, the enemy would really like to twist this all around. And so... The twisting can come in the form of um, your, your mind trying to reason things out or uh, being skeptical maybe of something that you heard. Um, twisting can come in that your heart just has a hard time believing what it is that you're actually hearing about the Word of God. And so let's just take a moment to pause and pray, can we? 
that God will just um, anoint the word and that it will um, not be distorted or the enemy will not have room to twist anything that is spoken of concerning the word of God. Can we do that? So, Father, we just thank you that we can stand on your word. God, we can proclaim the truth of your word. And so, Father, I pray that every word that comes out would be the truth of your word. Father, every word that is of man's uh, origin, um, I just throw it to the ground and let it die, Father. I want your word to come forth as the living word of God, the living, breathing word of God. And so, Father, we just silence the enemy this morning in any way, shape, or form that he would take to try and distort the word of God this morning. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just breathe on this word and let it resonate in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. And so last week we started a series on understanding um, who it is that we truly serve. We talked about the fact that Jesus is God. He's one with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. We looked at several scriptures which show the authority he has over every aspect of life. And this year, as we go through, we're going to be unfolding the experience of revelation. Revelation, we said, begins with Jesus. It's all about Jesus, and it ends with Jesus. True revelation. The purpose of revelation is to bring about the purposes of God in our personal lives or in society, um, perhaps in the church, but bring about his purposes on the earth. Revelation gives us vision and direction. Proverbs tells us without vision, the people perish. We need vision. We need direction. And so revelation brings to light those things which are hid in darkness, and it brings to light mysteries in the spirit realm. In order to have divine revelation, we need to know the giver of revelation. We need to understand who this king of glory is and believe in our hearts everything the scripture teaches about him, that it's the absolute truth. And so the question posed to you last week was, do you understand who Jesus is? And do you truly believe as fact what you have come to understand? And I hope you had time uh, to ponder that because, you know, we'll never completely 100% be able to comprehend and understand Jesus until we actually meet up with him. But we're called to grow in our knowledge, grow in our understanding, so that we can, you know, understand as much of the word as we can, understand who he is, his character, how he operates, how he thinks, understand his heart. We're called to grow in that understanding. In our life night studies, we are talking about Daniel's experience before King Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember, Nebuchadnezzar had a bad dream, and he wanted to have somebody who would come and interpret that dream for him. He called on the uh, astrologers and fortune tellers and magicians. They couldn't do it, but Daniel said, give me a chance to do it. And so Daniel went and he prayed, he got his friends to pray with him, and they prayed for God's intervention to receive revelation concerning the dream, concerning that mystery. And he received what the dream was and the interpretation of the dream. But Daniel knew his God. And so we can know God in the same way and receive those mysterious revelations. It's possible. And so again, I want to springboard from the scripture that we read last week in Hebrews, which said, therefore, remember we read through, we kind of gave a summary of who Jesus is in the first couple chapters, um, who he is, what he came to do, and then the writer of Hebrews says, therefore, because of all of that, think carefully about this Jesus whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. Think carefully. And so we're going to think carefully once again at Jesus today being the Word of God. And when we say the word, word, we're referring to things like a message, an utterance, a declaration, an expression of some sort, a voice, a revelation. It's something that is seen or heard, but it's never silent. 
And so, first of all, Jesus was the Word. He coexisted with the Father. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So saying that the Word was with God gave Jesus a distinct person. There's God the Son, God the Father. But to say that the Word was God puts them together as sharing the same quality and character and essence. The Word is seen in the first chapter of of the Bible where God created the world by speaking. He said, let there be light. And yet in John, the, the scripture that we just read this morning, said that nothing that is made was made without Jesus. And so that gives credit to Jesus being the creator of the world. Before coming to earth, the Word lived in the beginning with God, and he was himself God. The Word's first act was to work with God creating the universe. But today we read in John, in the beginning was the Word, and then we see that those words kind of echo Genesis 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So John located Jesus' existence in eternity past with God. The word is seen throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, we see the word being Jesus. We see it in God's commandments and covenants spoken through the patriarchs. We see it in what he spoke through the prophets. It's seen in the action through the commander of the Lord's army and speaking with Joshua. The word is referenced as a form of worthiness or honor in the Psalms, something worthy to be praised and honored, and the wisdom of God in the Proverbs. He is seen when the word comes as the incarnation of God. See, a second great act was to come and give life, spiritual life, and light to mankind. This God who once spoke the worlds into being, he spoke his very essence into the womb of a woman so that we could know him fully. Jesus speaks the word throughout the Gospels powerfully and demonstrates who he is. And then the word is seen in Revelation as the one who conquers. So we see the word from Genesis to Revelation. And that's why we can call him the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's why he could say that, uh, along with what he told Moses in the beginning, that I am, that I am. I am. Then we see where John describes the word became flesh. According to our scripture, the essential nature of the word is life. And this life gives light to people who live in darkness. The divine life resides in the word. And he made it available to all who would believe in him. Jesus, the living word, is the glorious and ultimate manifestation of a God who delights to disclose himself to us. The Logos, meaning the word that eternally existed as God the Son, and with God the Father, he became a human being, Jesus of Nazareth, so that he could reveal the Father and his will for humanity. And so therefore he is called the living word, or in 1 John, He's called the word of life. So Christ was in the world. It says that in verse 10. That speaks of his being in the world when he took our nature upon him and dwelt among us. He undertook to reconcile the world to God. And so he was in the world to settle that account. And then it says the word became flesh. That's talking about the human nature of Christ. The eternal word was made flesh. He was clothed with a body as we are and dwelt in the world as we do. Logos took on human form. He took up residence. He made his dwelling among us. The Greek verb here is literally meaning to dwell in a tent, which is a reference to the Old Testament tabernacle as God's dwelling place. Through his son, God is taking up a post among his people, just as he did for Israel. It's 
kind of the sense of a, a permanent stay. It's God's permanent dwelling among his people. And then we see Jesus as the written word. Reference to Jesus as the word in, in John 1 is logos. Logos is the written word. And so when we read the scriptures, we're learning about hearing Jesus speaking to us through the logos word. One pastor I heard speaking said, we love Jesus as much as we love his word. We love Jesus as much as we allow his word to cleanse us and change us. See, if we understand that Jesus is the word of God, that this is actually a physical representation of Christ being revealed, then we ought to see this as the revelation of Christ from cover to cover. We ought to value this as a revelation of Christ and allow it to examine us. This word can examine our hearts. It examines us. We don't examine the word. I mean, we examine to study, but we don't examine to scrutinize. It examines us. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And so there's no part of Scripture that can be treated as not relevant. Remember Jesus when he rose from the grave and just before he went back up to heaven to be with God, he, he started walking along the road to Emmaus with these couple of disciples who were chatting it up, talking about how they really didn't understand the last few days. And then Jesus started to talk to them, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, right from Moses, because it's all about him. It's the story of Christ being unfolded. There are many descriptions that we have of the Word of God. We would say it's true, it's flawless, it's infallible. The angels obey it. It's eternal, it's sweet and delightful. It is exalted above all things, it's irrevocable. It is the sword of the Spirit. It is not chained. It is living and active. It is living and enduring. And there's probably many more things that we would read in here that describes the Word of God. And so let's talk about the words logos and rhema. These are two terms in the Greek New Testament that are used for the term word. The first term, logos, was primarily used to denote the written word or the total message. Rhema was used to denote the, the spoken word. One passage where it makes that distinction is 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25. It says, For you have been born again through the living and abiding logos, God of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like that of the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word, this is the rhema, which was preached to you. See, God's word has power to execute his will, and it will not return to him void. It will do what it was sent to do. Jesus spoke the word of God. He was mighty in word. He taught with authority, exercising power over the sea, over demons, over uh, challenges, over death, over sickness. His word of the kingdom is the living word, which bears fruit for hearts that have receptive soil in them. The word that Christ gives to his disciples cleanses them and frees them. The words of Christ, combined with the words about Christ, constitute the word of Christ. This is the word or the message that the church preaches. And as I went through uh, where Jesus spoke the word and where the disciples were teaching the word, I saw a difference in a lot of the scriptures where many times Jesus spoke teaching the gospel, 
where it was a rhema word. But where the disciples spoke the same word, because it was a previous revelation, now that they are giving with the gospel, it is a logos word. It's something that had already been revealed. So words on the page are logos. Words that are breathed from God's mouth are rhema. When we read from the scriptures, it's logos. When God speaks a message through, say, the prophetic, it's a rhema word. Logos is the word given from the beginning. It's never ending, never changing. The rhema word is something spoken as a now word. When God quickens a word from logos to your heart, it becomes a rhema word. Do you ever have those moments where you're reading and all of a sudden something will jump off the page and, oh, I get it now. Oh, I needed that, God. Thank you so much. I understand what you're saying now. Have you ever had those moments? That's when logos became a rhema word specifically for you in that moment. God spoke into your situation. He breathed that word for you and gave life to it. Rhema is also a revelation of vision or direction, a revelation of instruction, enlightenment concerning the word. But the underscoring word for it all is revelation. God gives us revelation. And that's what we need right now in the church. We need revelation. We need God to breathe a rhema word to us. We need God to breathe a now word to us. Not only as individuals, but as a house. God, what, what are we doing? Where are we going? What's the plan for this house in this season? I found it interesting, Ephesians six seventeen, where it's talking about the, the armor of God, putting on the whole armor of God. And it said, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Word in this context is a rhema word. That's something I learned as I was studying this. It's a rhema word. It's a now word. It's take that sword and get a rhema word for your situation, what you're having to fight right now, for your battle. Get a rhema word and use it. It's take that sword and use something that God has promised or God has spoken to you or that God is, is revealing to you and take that sword and use it. It's a rhema word for that specific moment in time. A now word is often birthed in the spirit realm, and it can be described as either a word of instruction or direction that is needed, and then it's up to us to grab onto that word and do something with it. Or it's a word that it's, it's, it's already been done in the spirit realm. God says this is going to happen. God gives you a prophetic word or a prophetic vision. You just know that you know God's spoken something concerning your life or, or a circumstance, maybe a ministry that you're going to be doing. But it, it, it's not fulfilled yet. It's done in the spirit, but it's not fulfilled yet. We have to maybe do some battle for it. We have to pray for it. We have to exercise wisdom for it and discernment for it. And when the time has come, then it becomes a fulfilled word on the earth. It becomes done in the, in, in the natural realm, what has already been done in the spirit realm. And so based on Jesus being the word of God, the living, breathing word of God, Rama. Logos, Genesis to Revelation. What is your understanding? What has your mind been able to comprehend about this? I know this is not a, a, a new topic for anybody here. But as, as you're growing, as you're learning, are you getting deeper understanding concerning Jesus as the Word? We defined understanding by using words such as to grasp, you're acquainted with, to be thoroughly familiar with, to accept, to comprehend, to achieve the significance of. You understand how significant it is. And then what is your belief level concerning Jesus as the Word of God? We defined belief last week as accepted as true or genuine, firm, 
wholehearted conviction? Are you firmly convinced that Jesus is the living, breathing Word of God? That this Logos is perfect? That Rhema can be spoken into you? That there's life? That the prophetic voice of God is still speaking today? If we truly understand the implications and believe in our hearts without question that Jesus is the Word of God, then we can not only uh, powerfully apply it to our lives, but we can also use it as, as a weapon of our warfare, a tool of warfare against the enemy. You know, when we're, we're holding this as our defense for a circumstance, it's Jesus defending me. He's my defender. And so use the Word of God as a living, breathing organism in your life. But our ability to receive revelation begins with our ability to believe and understand Jesus as the Word of God, the living Word. We have to understand him as the living, breathing Word of God. That when we get revelation, that it is God-breathed, it is God-spoken, now, that's not to say that we don't go carefully. That's not to say that we don't make sure that what we see, what's revealed, does not line up with this. It has to. There's, there's guidelines for the prophetic. But the rhema word, if it's an authentic rhema word, it's God-breathed, and it's something that God wants to do, either in your life or in this house, this community, our nation. And we can... Apply what he has given to our lives. And so the challenge for you this week is this. To grow in your knowledge of the word. And we do that by growing in the knowledge of the word. See where your heart stands on the value that it places on the word. What's it worth to you? If someone came and confiscated all the Bibles you have in your house... Would that be a, uh, or would it be something that really, truly impacts you? Would you scramble to hide that one precious Bible so that they wouldn't find it? And then ask the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to you through the word and prepare you to receive revelation, a rhema word this year. We need God to speak into this house with a rhema word this year. We need revelation. And so we need to pursue knowing the giver of revelation. So will you pursue him with me? Will you go on that journey of wanting to get that revelation for this house and maybe for your lives personally? Will you grow in the knowledge of the word? Will you grow in your experience of receiving prophetic revelation? Is that a desire that your heart has? We ought to desire to know, God, speak to me. And so this week, allow this challenge to just penetrate. Let's pray. God, we just thank you that you are the living word. Jesus, you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha, the Omega, from the beginning to the end, the great I am. And we praise you, we honor you. And so, Father, we ask that this year, as we pursue knowing who you are, that, God, we would receive that revelation from you, revelation for our lives personally, revelation for this house, God, revelation as to what you are doing in the spirit realm. God, we need revelation. We need that now word, Father. And so we ask that as we pursue you, as we continue in, in our growth in prayer and reading your word, that God, you would indeed bring revelation to our hearts. And so we thank you for what is ahead. We thank you because you have good things still planned for this house. And so God, we just look to you as you unfold those things. May we stay in step with the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be blessed, everyone. Have a great week.